Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Sally Whipple. I'm the Executive Director of the Connecticut Democracy Center at Connecticut's Old State House, and we are so happy to have you here at the Old State House, whether you're here in person or watching this live streamed or as a recording. We're here today for a program called Turning the Tides of Justice. It's a remembrance of the African men and children who fought for their freedom on the high seas near Cuba and again in courtrooms from Hartford to New Haven to Washington, D.C. 182 years ago today, the Amistad trial started here in this room where you are now seated. This is the day the trial started. Singbe, Grabo, Kimbo, Nashaulu, Berna, Gbatu, Gnakwoi, Kwong, Fuliwa, Pie, Punguni, Sesi, Moru, Ndamma, Fuliwulu, Bao, Ba, Shule, Kale, Bagna, Sa, Kina, Gahoni, Fang, Fagina, Vaboy, Fabana, Sukama, Beri, Fani, Shuma, Kali, Teme, Hagne, Margu. Those are the names of some of the men and children we remember and honor today and every day. They came from Africa, and many returned from Af to Africa. They started their journey alone, but members of Hartford's Talcott Street Church supported them in their return home to Africa. Today, Talcott Street Church lives on as Faith Congregational Church, and Faith is supporting us today just as they supported the Amistad Africans. Our program today begins with Wayne Dixon, Minister of Music at Faith Congregational Church, and soloist Patricia Gray, performing Lift Every Voice and Sing, followed by Steal Away, performed by Voices of Hartford, a group of young men who raise their voices in order to help us lift ours. And I'd like to ask you to please rise for our first performance.
so much to Patricia Gray and Wayne Dixon from Faith Congregational Church and also to um, oh gosh Miles yes yes <laughs> <laughs> Tolliver Wilson Wilson Tolliver um, I think that hearing this music today is just so so important to the Amistad story because music communicates so many things so beautifully and one of the issues in the Amistad case was communication. People didn't speak the same language and they were trying to solve various problems. The Amistad case is incredibly complicated and you really run up against that when you try to give a tour to people who don't know anything about it at a historic site. And you have to be very, very particular and careful in the words you use or you may leave a wrong impression with people. So we have really been studying the Amistad story, trying to overcome some of the myths that surround it, to overcome some of the misinformation, and to read things very carefully. Our whole staff has been doing that, and the hard thing is when we get together to compare notes about what we've learned, we come up with many more questions than we had when we first started. Um, but one person who has really taken the lead on studying the Amistad story this year is Mariana Garcia. And she is the person who wrote the, wrote, read the names of the Amistad Africans at the beginning of this program. And now she's going to lay out the story of the Amistad for us so that we can keep it in our minds and our hearts. And I would like you to join me in welcoming Mariana to share this story. Thank you, Sally. And thank you, everybody, so much for being here today for the anniversary of the start of the Amistad trials and the Mende's legal battle for their freedom. On the hours before dawn of July the 2nd, 1839, the deck of the Spanish schooner La Amistad became a site of rebellion. Down in the cargo hold, 53 captive Africans managed to slip the chains binding their hands and feet together. Then they gathered around as they would when preparing for war and quietly plan their next move. For them, this was just the latest stretch on a months long horrific journey. Their saga started in Mendiland in Western Africa, where they had been kidnapped and forced on board a slave ship across the Atlantic to Spanish-ruled Cuba. All through their voyage, they were brutalized, bound, dehumanized, and finally sold like livestock in the markets in Havana. Their purchasers, Two Spaniards called José Ruiz and Pedro Montes chartered a small ship called La Amistad to take them and their cargo to the other side of the island. But just days into their journey, the Africans were readying themselves to fight back. By sunrise, they had taken control of the ship, killing the captain and other members of the crew 
but sparing Ruiz and Montes with the intention of forcing their would-be enslavers to sail them back to Africa. Months later and thousands of miles away, Connecticut's old state house came to be part of this epic saga when the Amistad Africans found themselves having to continue their fight for freedom, this time from within the United States legal court system. The Amistad case has become canonical uh, in the history of abolition here in the United States, and it's certainly one of the most famous stories in Connecticut and one of the cornerstone uh, stories here in the old state house. But in speaking with our visitors about it, we come to learn that many of them are surprised by some of the aspects of this story. So before we continue, I just really wanted to uh, point out a few facts uh, that some of you may already know, some of them might surprise you. The first is that slavery was legal here in Connecticut when the Amistad trial was taking place in 1839. And it had existed since colonial times and it would not be abolished until nine years after the Amistad trials in 1848. The second is that even though uh, uh, many states still uh, allowed slavery, uh, the federal government had outlawed the transatlantic slave trade many years before in 1808. This meant that it was illegal to bring people from Africa across the Atlantic to be sold into slavery here in the United States. For anyone to be considered legally enslaved and be legally sold and purchased, they had to have been born here in the United States. Great Britain, and most importantly uh, for the story, Spain, had also uh, passed similar laws abolishing the slave trade. But of course, many illicit slave ships still made the journey, including the one that brought the Amistad Africans to Cuba. And finally, the third point I wanted to bring out was to mention that the Amistad Africans were never really tried as criminals, and that the trials were not really about their mutiny on board the ship and the murder of the Amistad's crew. The federal courts determined very early on that they did not have jurisdiction to try the Africans for these charges. The issue at the heart of the case was actually much more sinister than this. Before the start of the trial here in Hartford, the US Navy captured La Amistad on Long Island Sound almost two months after their successful uprising near Cuba. They had drifted northwards, zigzagging up the eastern coast, and finally an uh, anchored in Montauk Point in New York to gather fresh water. That's where they were seized by the US Navy brig, the USS Washington. And this is also the moment when one of the key elements to understanding the Amistad uh, trial comes into focus. Because according to maritime law, if a ship rescued another ship that was in peril out at sea, the rescuers were entitled to a percentage of the value of that ship and its cargo as a reward for having uh, rescued the ship. This is called salvage. And the crew of the Amistad, uh, the crew of the Washington, sorry, knew this when they rescued, quote unquote, rescued the Amistad. And they also knew that if the Africans were considered legally enslaved and property and counted as part of the ship's cargo, this would add to the value of the reward that they would receive. So the issue, this would be the issue at the heart of the case, whether the, Amist uh, the Amistad Africans were free human beings or merely merchandise. So the Washington towed the Amistad to New London, uh, New London Harbor, and the commanding officer of the ship, uh, Lieutenant Thomas Getney, he immediately summoned a district court judge uh, to come evaluate the case so they could immediately file uh, their, their salvage claim. The judge who came aboard was a man called Andrew Judson. For some context on Judson, he was also the man, the main instigator behind the creation of the Black Law that made Prudence Crandall's school for black girls illegal just a few years before that in 1833. Judson convened a special session on board the ships and heard testimony from everyone involved except for the Africans because no one could understand their language. They were unable to tell their side of the story. So Getney wanted salvage, but of course the Spaniards, Ruiz and Montes, they were demanding that their property be returned to them. They claimed that the Africans had been legally purchased in Cuba, and uh, they had been Cuban-born, and they even produced fraudulent documents in order to back up their story. So with so many competing claims, Judson ordered the Africans to be kept in custody in the New Haven jail until their legal uh, property status could be verified. And the U.S. attorney also filed charges for piracy and murder against the Africans, 
But Judson referred these charges to the U.S. Circuit Court, where they would be very quickly, almost immediately dropped because of a lack of jurisdiction. But while waiting in jail for, the, for their day in court, the Africans collected many allies. A group of local abolitionists created the Amistad Committee to help them build their defense and fund their legal fees. Some of these allies spent hours with the Africans in jail trying to bridge the language barrier and to understand their story, till they finally found a translator, a man called John Ferry, who could speak a little bit of the, one of the many languages that the Africans spoke. So weeks later, most of the Africans came to Hartford for the first court hearings, and they were jailed in Pearl Street Prison, which would have been just down the street from here. And the trial began right here in this room on September 17th, 182 years ago today. The first part of the case fell to the Federal Circuit Court with Justice Thompson of the U.S. Supreme Court this presiding. The Africans' lawyer had, uh, lawyers, I should say, filed a habeas corpus for the children that were on board the Amistad, demanding their immediate release. They told the court that the children had been born free in Africa and never legally enslaved, thus invalidating their detention. Three little girls were brought to this courtroom, and one of the Amistad men called Bao, he testified in their behalf. But the judge denied the girls' release because they were still part of the property dispute between the Spaniards and the crew of the Washington. Following this, the court considered the criminal charges of piracy and murder and ruled that the U.S. did not, in fact, have jurisdiction to try them for these charges because they were events that took place out in the high seas on board a Spanish vessel. So those charges were dropped leaving only the property dispute for the court and the question of whether the Africans were free people or just cargo. So let's recap, because I'm sure there's a lot of uh, moving parts in this case. So Lieutenant Getney and his crew from the USS Washington were demanding salvage reward for having rescued the ship. And according to maritime law, this reward would come from the value of the ship's cargo. And in order to determine how much reward Getney and his crew were going to get, the court had to decide whether the Africans were considered legally uh, enslaved or legal property and would be counted as part of the cargo. Meanwhile, the Spaniards, Ruiz and Montes, were demanding their property be returned to them, still claiming that they had purchased the Africans legally in Cuba. The Spanish ambassador had also involved himself in the case on behalf of his countrymen and was putting pressure on the U.S. government to return this all Spanish property from on board the Amistad without deducting any uh, value for the salvage reward. And finally, the Africans, of course, were calling for their own release, insisting that they had been born free in Africa and had been illegally kidnapped and enslaved. All of these claims were heard right here in the Old State House by Judge Andrew Judson, part of the U.S. District Court. So the court adjourned on September 23rd and reconvened on November 19th, again here in Hartford in the old state house. Uh, all the Africans were taken back to New Haven and only a handful of them returned to Hartford for the continuation of the trial. But something important happened in the time in between the two sessions and that is the discovery of one James Covey, a young sailor from West Africa who was fluent in the Mendi language. And for the first time, the Africans finally had the ability to fully testify in their own defense and tell their whole story. So Covey was uh, recruited as their translator. So the second session, according to the newspapers, started upstairs in the Senate chamber. With Covey translating, the Africans brought a plea, challenging everybody's property claim over them. The lawyers demanded that the whole case be dismissed over a lack of, uh, because the Africans had been born free. But unfortunately, further testimony had to be postponed because James Covey fell ill. If it had not been for that, perhaps the entirety of the, tri the Amistad trials would have taken place here in Hartford. But instead, uh, the reminder of the hearings will be heard down in New Haven the following year, starting January 7th of 1840, after Covey had uh, recovered. So you probably know the rest of the story. Many of the Africans continued to argue their court case in New Haven, while the case garnered immense public interest all over the country and beyond. After hearing testimony after testimony, Judge Judson finally ruled that the Africans were in fact natives of Mendiland, not Cuban born, and that they had been kidnapped and sold against both Spanish and United States law. Therefore, they would not be considered part of the ship's cargo 
or counted as part of the shop salvage reward for Getney and his crew. Instead, they had to be released and returned to Africa. But this ruling was famously appealed by the US government, in part because President Martin Van Buren wanted to maintain good diplomatic relations with the Spanish crown. So after a short appeals hearing in the Federal Circuit Court, again here in Hartford, the case moved up to the United States Supreme Court down in Washington, DC. This is when former President John Quincy Adams joins the, the Amistad's defense team. And it's also when the Amistad uh, Africans claim their final victory in court in March 9th of 1841. And the entire case, the entire court case lasted almost one year and a half. After this, the Amistad Africans regrouped with their allies, including members of the Talcott Street Church in Hartford, uh, to find a way to return back home with their uh, hard-won freedom. But this ending is bittersweet because of the original 53 men and children that were on board the Amistad, only 35 survived long enough to make the journey back home. And while many of them did reunite with their families, some were tragically never able to find their loved ones again. But the story continues to inspire us and urge us to reflect on the length that, hum that the human spirit can go in its fight for freedom. So that was a very brief uh, overview of the Amistad case. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Mariana. That is a lot of work to boil that story down, but she really hits all of the important marks on it. And one thing that we realize as we look at the Amistad case is that there are many ways to learn about history and many ways to begin understanding how it impacts our lives today. You can look at images from the past. You can read primary documents. You can read what other historians have done. You can um, also have an experience like the one you are about to have um, with a woman named Tammy Denise, who is a good friend of ours. She is a performing artist, a storytelling teller, an actor, and a playwright. And she specializes in breathing life into the stories of important women who have been hidden from history. We are so lucky that Tammy has chosen as one of the women she portrays, Margu, a child of the Amistad. And today, um, she is really going to help us um, better imagine and understand the experience that Margu would have had in the courtroom. You can also go down to the ship, which is docked down at the riverfront, and think about the experience Margu would have had on that ship, La Amistad. But today, we're really going to focus on the courtroom. And so I'd like to introduce Tammy Denise. And where you lay is where you lead yourself. 
There were cats and rats, and there were those who screamed out in hysterics for fear of not knowing where we were going. And although we could not speak the same tongue, we knew that we were headed for an uncertain destiny, one that we could not fare well in. And after a few days of being aboard this large vessel, we were transferred to a smaller vessel called La Amistad. <laughs> Oddly, that name means friendship, but I tell you, the treatment we received was less than friendly. They would torture us, they would treat us so cruelly, and they would make the mistake of doing this to one of the elders. And that is when Elder Singbe knew that something had to be done. And so, as blacksmiths in a village, they knew how to work the chains, and they would break them loose, and they would take this vessel, and they would force the captains to take us back in the direction of the sun, for that is the way from which we come. But at night, they would deceive us and take us in a different direction. And for many, many moons, we would go up and down this big river until finally someone would come, and they would take us, and they would bring us into a place called New London, Connecticut. I would later find out that if they had taken us to a place called New York, that we could have been free. But because of these salvaging rights, they would bring us there. The jail would take all of us and put us into his cell, and he would offer our people would pay him money to come and see us. They would gawk at us as if we were animals. And the jail, he made lots of money. He would take us three girls, myself, Kanye and Kimi, and we would have to go to his house to be workers. They did not treat us well. We missed the elders, and soon we were told that there would be a trial, that they had to decide if we were going to be free. I did not understand the dog. I was very much afraid. So one day, we were brought to this very room, here where I stand. I remember that day so well. I was afraid. I remember shaking and I remember crying. I was so afraid I did not know what would happen to us. But then a calm came over me when I looked and I saw the elder. I saw Elder Singbe and he gave me a look that made me feel safe. I did not know how we would be safe, but he made me feel safe. He reassured me with that one look. I did not understand what they were saying. I just wanted to go home. And soon it was over and we were taken back to the jailer's home. But then we were brought back a little while later. And this time, when I walked into this room, I could speak their language. I could understand what they were saying. And they were saying that we were not people. They talked about us as if we were property, that we belonged to them. This is not true. We were coming from our home, and they snatched us from what was most familiar to us, our home, our families, and they wanted to make us their property. Soon as time would go on, I would meet Mr. Arthur Tucker. He brought me the next time to that trial, and again, I was upset and I cried. He offered me an apple, and he told me that I would be okay. I felt a little calm, but I felt even calmer when I saw the elders again. Again, I would get that look that we would be okay. Now, we were going to be taken into Farmington, but as that trial was going on, the fear that I felt, I just wanted to go home. I had never felt so, how do you say, unsafe and, and vulnerable. There was nothing but pale-faced little discourse around me, and all I could think of was how I really wish that they were a legend, that I was back home with my family, but instead I was surrounded by them. I did not know how I would be. Again, I would look to the elders for security and safety, and they would give me that. But I was so uncertain, for they were shackled. They were like animals. Why do they treat them this way? They are elders in our village. They are people. I did not understand why did they wish to keep us here. We just want to go home. But then we would be taken into the place called Farmington. And there, they treated us better, but not so much so. They did not welcome us the way they made the public think that we were welcomed. 
and soon we would be free of sorts. But we could not go back home because we did not have the money. And soon, those in the area, the abolitionists, and they would take us on what is called a, how do you say, a speaking tour, where we would go and we would speak of our adventure about our start. <laughs> adventure. We would talk about what happened here in this very room. We would talk about the treatment we would receive aboard both vessels, and we would talk about our own lives. We would sing and we would dance, but all we wanted was to go home. And I tell you, each time we told the story of how we felt in this courtroom, it made me feel empty inside. It made me feel scared. It made me feel out of sorts. I miss my family. I just wanted to go home. But as I stand here today and I tell you the story, it is not one that I take lightly. It is one that would change our lives forever. It was a two-year adventure for us, but our lives would never be the same. But throughout my life, I would remember what life was like in this very room. I remember being a little girl who sat on a bench whose feet could not touch the floor. I remember sitting there wishing that my father was coming to get me. And then I remember sitting and looking at the elders and somehow feeling secure, although they were shackled and treated unjustly. I remember that feeling of vulnerability. I remember. That is a perfect way to think about history and the feelings in our past. And um, we'd like to offer a few moments for you if you have any questions for Tammy Denise. She would be happy to answer them. No questions? It's okay, you can ask me. Tammy Denise will be over here and Sarah Margu will be over here. <laughs> so I'll stand right here in the middle. <laughs> yes. Uh, how long did it take me to get the linguistics and the dialogue? Uh, let's see. Once I started hanging around my friend that came from Nigeria, I picked it up like that. Uh, but it took a while for me to get close to someone, um, but it was not hard. I did my ancestry, not ancestry, what's the other one? African ancestry DNA, and I found out I'm from Cameroon, so that made it easier. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes, sir. I do have a question. I mean, I don't know if you can answer this, but um, I was reading uh, a couple days ago that uh, my guru actually returned back to the Temple Yes. And went back as a missionary in Sierra Leone? Yes. Okay. If you come to the family day on Sunday, you'll get to hear her whole entire story. <laughs> and just one last thing. My DNA goes back to Cameroon also. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. oh, we must talk. <laughs> <laughs> Are there any other questions? Yes, ma'am. Thank you so much. We just were on the um, Amistad boat, and they were telling the story, just like the young lady did here. Mm -hmm. And what struck me when you were telling the story is, you know, we were talking about Farmington, and they were welcoming, and, you know, and people went out on speaking tours to raise money. And from hearing it from your voice and your person, it really opened my eyes what that was really like. You know, mm -hmm. even though it was better than being in jail, certainly, maybe. But, and it was like reality to raise money to go back home. But still, you really, I, I just was really struck by that. Thank oh, you. Thank you. Thank you so very much. Yes, ma'am. I did my DNA as well, and I'm Cameroon and so. All right, then. Okay, we got to talk. <laughs> thank you for that. Yes. And I'm wondering, kind of, what are your motivations? How did you get started? What motivation did you do? 
Um, I'm originally from Columbus, Mississippi. And growing up in Mississippi, as big of a conundrum as that is, um, it was important, education was very important, but when we migrated to New England, history was not being taught correctly. And um, it was a shock to me to learn that black, the black community here did not know its heritage, that it didn't go any further than Martin Luther King and Harriet Tubman. And that was disturbing to me. And so as I got older, I decided that I wanted to teach, but I wasn't really sure how. I spent four years working for Connecticut Historical Society, and um, actually I heard about the Amistad through Ms. Debbie Allen's um, pursuit to try to get the story told. And then when I worked at the Historical Society, I had the pleasure of being a guide and an educator to do the five-room tour of the Amistad. And that is where I learned more and more. But my roots in Mississippi, I knew my great-grandmother. She was formerly enslaved. She lived to be 125. And my grandmother lived to be 107. So it was very important for me to tell other than the basic um, so, stories and to um, get beyond only two black prominent people because in Mississippi it wasn't Martin for us it was Medgar Evers so they were best friends but it was Medgar Evers so that was my catalyst to um, do what I'm doing thank you for that question thank you yes uh, have you personally had a chance to return to Africa have I done what having a chance to return to Africa uh, where's Margo Margo over here wait Oh, Tammy? No. Tammy has not. I was getting ready to take a trip to Ghana just before COVID, and so that trip has been put on hold because I have to do some research for uh, one of my other women, Belinda Royal, and um, I was planning to sort of like do a little trip for both areas for both women, so I have no idea when I'm going to get to go now, but that was the plan. So hopefully it'll happen soon. Who knows? Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Are there any other questions or comments? Don't be shy. So y'all all knew about Margo? Y'all all knew beyond the legal case? <laughs> yes, sir. Are there many male males that go around telling these stories? Um, no. There's not many black people in this area that's doing what I do. So um, I'm, I'm looking for people. I am looking. I have um, the Hidden Women Stage Company, and I have been trying for years to get others to do this because I can't do it forever, and the stories need to um, continue. So um, unfortunately, there aren't many of us. Kevin Johnson from the Connecticut State Library, he is one that does private web, and he has another gentleman that he's getting ready to do, I think Mr. Thorpe. But um, there are groups that's actually not in Connecticut, but there are some of us doing it, but not that many around here. So I'm sort of alone. <laughs> so I'm kind of alone. Yeah. Yes. I would just like to thank you for the part you're taking um, in addressing an issue that you mentioned, and that is um, the way American history is mistaught. Yes. And how it's really history by omission. Yes. So I really um, so appreciate thank you. what thank you're doing. Thank you so much. Thank you. I wanted to tell her story because everyone was focusing on the legal case, and they were making John Quincy Adams the great white savior and the hope, and he didn't even want that. He didn't even want it, but that's what history does. And so I wanted to speak to the humanity of the captives, and I wanted to speak to their resilience and their determination to be treated as human beings and to get back home. And um, the main, that was the main catalyst for wanting to tell Margot's story, because until I did the research and was at CHS, I didn't even know there were four children either. And the movie doesn't even speak to it, but we'll, the movie is Hollywood. But it got, it got the story out there, so I am grateful for that. But they don't even talk about the four kids. So it was important to tell their story. And like I said, if you come on Sunday, you'll get a more in-depth story of her life and what happens when she goes back to Africa. I go on at 1.30 in front of the Amistad at Riverfront Recapture. So if you're in the area, please come down and um, support the program. We'd really love to see you. Um, if no one else has any other questions or comments, I will be here. So if you wanted to talk to me afterwards, I will see you at the end. Yes, ma'am. One thing that I did see when I read all the information that I spoke with, mm -hmm. yeah, she was a missionary with white faith. Didn't see, was she Catholic? Was she Protestant? Was she? Um, it's, oh, goodness, that went right. <laughs> Whoa, 
okay, who knows the answer to that? The church in Farmington, is it um, congregationalist? It is congregationalist, yes. She was a congregationalist because of what was happening in Farmington. And they would go back, but you got to come hear the rest of the story. So you got to come hear the rest of the story to hear about that adventure and what happened in Farmington. I mean, um, even though Farmington liked to say they were all welcoming, Mm -mm. <laughs> so you got to come here to store me on Sunday. Thank you, everyone, so very much. I appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tammy. And I, I do encourage you to go down to the riverfront on um, Sunday the Discovering Amistad organization, which um, runs the schooner and um, a number of educational programs that teach about um, the story of the Amistad and social justice. Um, they, the schooner is down in Hartford. It's the first time it's been here in 20 years. And if you go to Family Day on Sunday, you'll see a lot of great performances and have a chance to learn more about the ship and the story. Um, as um, Tammy mentioned, um, the Congregational Church in Farmington was active in um, housing and working with um, people who were on the Amistad. Um, and Talcott Street Church in Hartford, as I mentioned before, which is now Faith Congregational Church, was also playing a very important role in that story. Um, they helped raise money, and they helped organize a missionary group and two members of that church actually went back to Africa with Margu and all of her other um, companions from the Amistad. So this church has played a very important role. And there, there are so many different aspects of this story. And I think one of the things about the story is it has every emotion in the world attached to it. But it also has the feeling of inspiration attached to it. And I have not known Pastor Cleo Graham from Faith Congregational Church for very long. She's been here since November of last year, and I've only known her for a few short months. But I had the pleasure um, uh, to, of spending, like, I, I invaded her space for three hours one afternoon and talked with her and her husband, Melvin Graham, for a very long time about life and about history and about how history informs personal life, community life, it was a wonderful conversation, and so it would be impossible to have a program today without having Pastor Cleo here to share her thoughts and her inspirations with all of you. We feel so honored to have her here today, and I would like um, to ask you to, to come up and speak to our group. Thank you, uh, Sally, for those kind remarks. That was time well spent. Even though I said I only had 15 minutes, it was the best three hours that I spent in a long time in between Zoom meetings. Um, I also want to really introduce my husband, who is an African-American genealogist and a great historian that I get a chance to pick his brain often, and that's Melvin Graham. Um, I always say that we met 33 days after I arrived at college, so that was many years ago, and we're still very close. I do want to thank um, Sally and the uh, committee for putting this gathering together. I want to also acknowledge Faith Congregational Church, who is here, and um, also Wayne and Patricia and the group that just recently sang, um, Miles. I want to really thank you, uh, Tammy, for your portrayal because I had a choice of who I might study, Margot or the boy, the 11-year-old boy, so you kind of closed a gap for me. And thank you also for being related somewhat to my husband, who he found out uh, was uh, connected with uh, Cameroon as well, and also Paula as well, so thank you very much. So I get to give a reflection, and I'm so used to preaching these days that I had to kind of sit tight a bit and not be preachy. I'm also very interested in the history as well. Um, the Amistad um, Africans in America is a historic and an inspiring 
story that kind of captures our faith, our hope, our love, our trust, our courage, and our resilience, and so much more. I love visiting these types of stories because it really inspires me. Just imagine being a slave and then wanting to be free and becoming free, how, how that must feel. It is a journey from slavery to freedom that builds our sense of community because it's something that we cannot do alone. It builds our sense of human rights and justice. It builds our courage. It builds our resilience. And it challenges us to respond to this great gospel of Matthew, who says, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, thy mind, our soul, and love your neighbor as yourselves. Who is our neighbor? Who is our neighbor? We have called, we're called to love our neighbor, to love our neighbor as ourselves, but who are we and who are our neighbors and how close or how far is our neighbor today? This Amistad story tells us that our neighbor is beyond these walls. It's beyond even our zip codes. It's far, it's several communities wide. And several communities can be instrumental in fighting injustices. We have shown that we have done it during the 1800s. What about now? Do we still have the stuff to do it even today? Do we? I don't hear anyone saying yes. <laughs> yes, yes. So it's a compelling story about trust and faith. It's compelling. And it's a fight. And so the, we think, think back to what it must have been like. Faith Congregational Church, let me tell you a little bit about faith. Because it's the type of church that makes me want to wake up in the morning in Rhode Island where I live and drive for two hours to come to spend time with this church because it breathes history. It breathes history. It breathes involvement. Faith Congregational Church in 2019 celebrated its 200th uh, anniversary. And it has its roots in the African Religious Society, which began in 1819. And then it transitioned to the Talcott Street Church. You will notice that churches change their names, but they don't change the people. <laughs> they don't change the people. And so what was happening in 1826, though, was a place, it was a time when African Americans couldn't really, say, worship together with people of other colors. In fact, you would find in Hartford that some of the folks had to worship behind walls, behind galleries, to be not even heard or seen. And we know that such a place existed back then. They call it Center Church today, and it's certainly not like that today. But this is what groups had to face during that time. And so, but in 1820, this congregation moved to a building in State Street and formed the first black congregational church in Connecticut and the third and oldest in the country. The church initially called itself, again, the African Religious Society of Hartford, but made a commitment to design a place where any and everyone could come and worship together. And then finally, it grew so large that in 1826, it built a stone and brick church on the corner of Talcott and Market Street. And the reason why I emphasize the stone and brick because we have one of those bricks or stones impregnated in our current church at a faith congregational church. And I'm so glad about that because again, as I mentioned last week, that when I came first to Hartford looking for Talca Church, I couldn't find the remnants of it. I couldn't find a flag, I couldn't find a plaque, nothing. But what I did find was the stories the soul, and that's most important. I found the souls of the people. And so they built this Talcott Street Church, very, very active church in the community. And now we're Faith Congregational Church, but again, 
the soul is still there. So the Amistad story, as we remember, began in 1839. We had slave hunters who abducted uh, Africans and then several days into the journey, they end up off the coast of, of Connecticut. And I won't go into detail about that because you've heard that story. But let me tell you about the pastor of Talcott Street Church during that time. His name was Reverend James C.W. Pennington. And he was the head, but at the same time, he was a slave himself. He had escaped from Maryland, still a slave, but was bent on helping these other slaves, was willing to risk his life to help them. And so he, the, the other interesting thing about Reverend Pennington and Faith Congregational Church today, if you were to enter our church, you would see a plaque. And that plaque was left by the previous owners. The previous pastor there happened to be related to Harriet Beecher Stowe. Now her brother-in-law purchased James Pennington so that he could have his freedom. See the connections, aren't they, aren't they interesting? He purchased him so that, so that he could have eventually have his freedom, and he did, Reverend Pennington did gain his freedom. But that's a story for another day, and those discussions are coming up. But I just want you to know about the connections. Anyways, by, 18, by the 1830s, there was a rise of abolitionist movements in this area. And we had many abolitionists that showed up and they, they spoke. We had Henry Highland Garnett. We had Arnold Buckman. We had so many here throughout uh, New England. And then there was this anti-slavery society as well. So people were really revved up and ready to help where they could, but they needed someone to galvanize people together. And that's where Reverend Pennington comes in. He organized supportive groups throughout the neighborhood and gathered them together and aggressively raised funds to help those who were in, uh, in prison he had people uh, attend the trials daily. He had many ways of telling the story and, and helping uh, the people that were incarcerated. And by, um, by 1841, we find that all this ended up to be such a reward for not only the church, but for the people because they were eventually uh, set free. And Reverend Pennington gives sort of this opening uh, prayer to uh, thousands of people that showed up to hear the story about the, what they call Men Mendian uh, people. And it was during this farewell gathering that Sinbe and Sinke, they called him, testified. He said, if it had not been for the Lord on my side, where would I be? And so we understand that many of them, I don't want to say converted to Catholicism, but they learned about the God that the Talcott Street and the other churches celebrated. They learned about the Christ. They learned that we are one people. And we became a community with them as well. And so he said he was thankful for the committee for befriending him. And he spoke about his love for Christ. And he spoke about so many gifts that he received. And so I want you to think about what it means to be in relationship with one another. That's a gift. Even people that are different from, from us. We receive many gifts, and there's a magnitude of captives even today. And have you made a relationship with one of them? You know, we learn to love and we learn to have compassion through practice. Otherwise, we would never understand what it means to be a comforter. And so giving the gifts of faith, hope, and love is often the kind of support that most people need. Freedom doesn't mean that you're 
You're bound physically. Sometimes people are bound even emotionally or spiritually. But they depend upon our love and our comfort. Giving the gifts of love, hope, and faith is a source of power. Power for the giver and power for the receiver as well. The book of Acts reminds us that God sends a comforter for us, this invisible spirit that comes to us, sometimes through people, <clears throat> but comes to us and helps us during these very tough and disturbing times. But we receive this power to overcome whatever bondage that we're in. And so we remember these words that blessed are the pure in heart, blessed are the meek so they shall inherit the earth. And it reminds me of the story of Kale. He's the 11 year old boy who barely spoke English, but he took these few words together and he wrote a letter to the former president, John Quincy Adams, who was officiating the trial, their trial. And he said, we want to ask the court what we have done wrong. All we want is to make us free. And it was so profound that an 11-year-old boy would do something like that and he got an answer. He got a long answer from John Quincy Adams. And John Quincy Adams heard him. And I really believe that that was also a turning point for the whole trial. Because John Quincy Adams sent a farewell letter to the Mendians and the prospect of them returning to their native land. The gift of hope. The gift of hope was given to them. And so that helps you to fight on. And so what happened? How, how did Talcott Street Church fare after, after the trial was over and there was a successful judgment? It didn't end there. We had members. We had, they say, two, two members named Henry Wilson, who was a tailor, who was born enslaved in Barbados but lived as a free man in Hartford, and his wife, Tamar Clark Wilson. They went on the boat with them, and they became a part of the group. But not only that, they went as missionaries to build relationships again between America and the Mendy people. There was also Reverend and Mrs. William Raymond and Reverend James Steele. So there were five of them that accompanied 35 of the remaining Amistad Africans to Sierra Leone as missionaries. And so that's what it means to build community and to build up one another. It just doesn't end. And so in closing, because so much was said, I want you to think in terms of the Sankofa bird. Sankofa bird that looks back and gathers all that we need today, but always steps forward. The past certainly informs us. And we today, when I look upon this audience today, I say it's probably very, very different from what it was in the 1800s. But we're community. You showed up here because there's an interest. We're community. And so I say to love, one another as you would love yourself. Think in terms of that. Most times when people act up, it's because they don't have enough love. So love one another, comfort one another, be in community with one another so that history does not repeat itself. Amen, amen. amen. Thank you so much, Pastor Cleo. I love your talk of community and building relationships because uh, this case, the story would not have gone anywhere had people not formed relationships on La Amistad that enabled them to fight for their freedom. If they hadn't formed relationships when they got 
to New London, to Hartford, to New Haven. Um, that is such an important part of this story and every story, and I think it's an important idea to keep close to our hearts as we work to carry the Amistad story forward in our own lives. We're, we're going to end our program today with more music. And I am going to say a couple of things before that because I don't want the last thing that you hear tonight to be my voice. I want the last thing you hear tonight to be the music. Um, I do want to um, remind you again to go down to the schooner, to come back here to visit, to stay with us after this program. We have some light refreshments. You can see the Senate upstairs where the part of the trial was and you can enjoy the old state house. You'll also see around um, this room some of these bookmarks and on the back are QR codes that will bring you to programs that we have done about the Amistad over the last many years, um, video programs, and you will also find articles related to the Amistad story that you might find interesting and helpful. And I also would like to thank everybody who has made today possible. Rebecca Tabor is the head of public programs here. She did a lot to organize this tonight. Mariana did a wonderful presentation tonight. She put a lot of work into that. And the rest of our staff is here, and I hope you will meet them as you visit the rest of the building tonight. But now I would like to um, introduce again um, Miles Wilson Tolliver, who is accompanied by James Berry. He is going to perform for us, and um, I think that will be a wonderful way to end this story. We've talked a little bit today about um, Sengbe Pia, um, also known as Sinke, who was a master communicator who could make people understand what he was saying even when he didn't speak the language. And um, I also want to remind everybody that these were very young men who came over, who came here on the Amistad. There were four children. Most of these men were 30 or younger. They were young men who raised their voices, who made a difference. And one thing I love about the voices of Hartford, even though I'm just getting to know them, I feel like they're in this same vein of helping people to raise their voices, and that is just so important. So I would like to welcome back um, Miles Wilson Tolliver and James Berry and the voices of Hartford.
Thank <laughs> you. 